Hi, I'm Leslie Ludi, host of the Set Apart podcast, Biblical Encouragement for Women of All Ages. We are starting a new series today that I'm really excited about, and it's Most Asked Questions. So all of the questions that you have been asking me over the years, things that I've heard as I've interacted with women of all ages, questions that have come in through books that I've written or other podcast episodes that we've done, I've sort of compiled those into some of the most commonly asked questions or things that we struggle with as women and just applying biblical truth to those areas. So today we're going to dive into a really key question that I think most of us have struggled with or maybe are currently struggling with, why hasn't God answered my prayer? So before we dive in, I just wanted to let you know that space is filling very quickly for our Set Apart Conference, and that's happening June 7th through 9th here in Colorado at our Ellerslie campus, or you can tune in anywhere via simulcast. If you register for a simulcast, you'll have access to the conference for the rest of the year, so you can pick a time that works for you. It's a great way to share the message with other women in your life, and our theme this year is He is experiencing the extraordinary reality of Jesus. So really excited about what God's going to do in this really special weekend. If you're interested in joining us for this year's conference, just click the link in this podcast description or go to setapart.org and click on the events tab. And again, we have limited space if you're coming to the event in Colorado, so don't wait too long to register. Love to see you this year. Let's talk about that question that we often struggle with, why hasn't God answered my prayer? And one question that came in recently, which I think a lot of people can relate to, says this, I've prayed for deliverance from bad things, and the answer was those bad things happening. Why? Why does God allow disturbing things in my life that feel like they're making me weak instead of stronger? I want to go through today five reasons why it may seem like God is silent or God is not answering or God may be giving you the opposite of what you're praying for. Because sometimes just removing the blur and taking a biblical look at how God deals with us in our prayer lives and the nature of God and how God interacts with us and really understanding what prayer is can be such a healing process to walk through instead of just letting the enemy constantly hit you with, God doesn't care about you, he didn't answer your prayer, because that's what we're very prone to starting to believe when we don't have biblical clarity to that question. So the first reason why God may not be answering our prayer, or it might feel like he's not, is giving up too easily, stopping before the breakthrough has come. All throughout scripture, we see this concept of wrestling prayer. And probably the most classic scriptural example is Jacob wrestling with the man of God, the angel of God, until the breaking of dawn saying, I will not let you go until you bless me. And that is such a picture of that wrestling match that we are to have. We're kind of, as Eric describes it, like kind of pulling on this you know, rope until we get what we're after. And a lot of times what we're praying for isn't necessarily the answer. It's we're praying for the faith to trust that God has heard our prayer and that He is working on our behalf. And once we have that faith, that position of faith, the answer follows, whatever God's answer is to our prayer. And so a lot of times wrestling through to that position of faith for a specific thing that we're praying for is a process, and it's a wrestling match, and it's something that we need to be very proactive and go after over an extended period of time, not something where you just kind of pray once or twice, and if nothing happens, you give up. And definitely in my life, I had so many seasons before I understood the concept of wrestling prayer, where I would just pray these broad, general, fairly wimpy prayers, and I would only pray a few times, and then I would just kind of give up and say, well, I guess God didn't hear me, or he doesn't care, or he doesn't want to answer, and I would just back off. And so I kind of lived in this state of feeling like God was not answering my prayer. The the scripture that really changed my perspective on persistence and continuing to go after that answer, even if it seems silent at first, even if heaven seems silent at first, was the story of the Canaanite woman who was following Jesus. So he's walking along, he has his disciples with him, he has a huge crowd with him, and here's this woman who wasn't even of the the people that Jesus was there to speak to. She was an outsider, and she came, and she was desperate because she knew that Jesus was the answer to her most desperate need, and that was her daughter was severely demon-possessed. And no doubt she had tried a lot of other solutions. She had 
she had tried everything. I, as a mother, I can say if you had a child in that kind of situation, and we don't know all the details, but you would try everything you possibly could to see your child set free from that kind of situation. And she knew that Jesus was her only hope. So she began to follow him and cry out after him and make a lot of noise and cause some people to get irritated with her. And Jesus was completely silent at first. It seemed like he didn't even hear her or acknowledge her, like he was ignoring her. I think a lot of times we feel that way when we're first starting to bring our requests before God. God, can you even hear me? Why do? You, why does it feel like you're so silent? She continued to cry out after him. She didn't let that silence deter her. And it was even to the point where the disciples were saying, could you please send her away? They were saying this to Jesus, please send her away because she's crying out after us, meaning she's very annoying. And Jesus still does not answer, does not acknowledge, does not say anything. And finally, he acknowledges her and allows her to come and present her request. But even then, he says, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So she cries out for help. He says, basically, I can't help you. I wasn't sent to help this group. I was only sent to help this group. And her answer is not like, well, I guess, you know, the answer is no, I tried. Her answer is yes, Lord, but even the little dogs take from the crumbs that have fallen from the children's table because he says, it's not okay for me to take the bread that was meant for the children and, and throw it to the dogs, which you know, that kind of answer, you would think somebody would get insulted. Instead, she just said, can I please have one of the crumbs that falls from the the table? And instead of saying to her, woman, you are being very annoying. Why don't you just be quiet and leave me alone? He says, woman, great is your faith. And then he heals her daughter. And what an incredible picture of the kind of persistence that we need to have in our praying when we know we are praying something according to the heart of God, a burden that God has given us, or something that is according to Scripture, the nature of God. Say say maybe we're praying for someone who is unsaved, somebody who does not know Christ, or someone who is veering away from truth. We know that it is in, in accordance with God's will to wrestle in prayer for that person. And that is the heart of God, is to rescue and to redeem that person's life. And even though there's a huge battle over them and the enemy is after that person too, we know that we can pray with persistence. We can wrestle in prayer. We don't need to just say, well, it doesn't look like God's answering. I guess I'll just give up. God is asking us to continue to seek and knock and be persistent and wrestle. The other thing that goes along with this is learning how to pray specifics and also pray until the breakthrough comes. So praying specific means don't just pray these broad, general, wimpy prayers, which is like, Lord, I just pray that you bless my life or help me in general. But if you have a specific burden, a specific need, bring that specific need to God. And people will tell you sometimes, well, don't pray specifics because that will weaken your faith if God doesn't answer that prayer. It's a lot safer to pray these broad, general prayers where you can't really tell if God's answering or not, but just hopefully He's hearing you. It's actually praying specifics when I finally began to have the courage to do that built my faith because I recognized, wow, I can see God actually answering specific things that I prayed and specific things that I laid before Him. It doesn't always happen right away, which is why we need to wrestle until the breakthrough comes. Charles Spurgeon said this, there is a general kind of praying which fails for lack of precision. It's as if a regiment of soldiers should all fire off their guns anywhere. Possibly somebody would be killed, but the majority of the enemy would be missed. It's a great picture of how so many of us pray. It's just kind of like, just kind of throw it out there and hope something sticks. And yet, if you study the pattern of prayer in scripture, it's praying with persistence, with diligence, with with that wrestling spirit and praying specifics. And praying specifics will build our faith if we are consistent in doing that. We had a season, Eric and I, where we felt very weak in a lot of areas of our life. And we wrote down a list of those areas and we started to pray every single day with persistence, wrestle in prayer for victory in those areas until we knew there had been a breakthrough. It might have been a breakthrough in our faith where we just had the confidence that God was working and we didn't need to constantly keep bringing it before Him, or we actually saw a physical change or a circumstantial change in something that we were praying for. Ian Bounds has many great classic works on prayer. One of his, one of my favorite quotes of his says this, "'He prays not at all who does not press his plea.'" Our praying needs to be pressed and pursued with an energy that never tires, a persistency which will not be denied, and a courage 
that never fails. If you don't feel like you can pray that way, my encouragement to you is to ask God to infuse you with that wrestling spirit of prayer and go to the Word of God and look at the way Jesus asks us to pray, look at the pattern of prayer in Scripture, and you will be inspired to realize that broad, general, wimpy praying that gives up after a time or two is actually not the biblical way to pray. And it just gives you a whole new vision for that wrestling in prayer. Now, what if we don't know what God what answer God wants to give? How can we be specific and persistent if we're not really sure God wants us to ask for these things or if he really wants to answer? I would encourage you to consider the fact that God repeatedly asks us in scripture to pray without ceasing, to pray continually, to pray earnestly, and to pray proactively. So when we wrestle in prayer, some people feel like it's being pestering towards God or being presumptuous, but we are actually praying in obedience to him when we wrestle in prayer. First Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. And then you can look in Luke 18, where he talks about a parable specifically about prayer, where he says, men always... Men ought always to pray and never lose heart. There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, Get justice for me for my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said, and shall not God avenge his own elect, who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Will he really find faith on the earth? Is what it actually says. And that's a very challenging story because here's this parable of a widow going to a judge over and over and over again until he finally says, okay, I'm going to grant her request so she will not continue to come back. And he's saying if an unjust judge would respond that way, how much more our Father in heaven who loves us and, and sacrificially gave everything he could give to redeem us. It says in John 16, 23, most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. That is kind of a baffling scripture right there to realize, wow, he's saying we have asked nothing in his name. Ask and receive that our joy may be full. There's also another parable that Jesus tells where the friend comes at midnight and another friend's in bed and he doesn't want to get up and and lend him bread, but the friend keeps knocking at the door saying, a neighbor has come to visit me. I think it's a neighbor or relative and I need, I have no food to give this person, so I need you to lend me some. And finally, because of that consistent knocking and persistence, the, the neighbor gets up and gives him what he needs. And it says, Jesus says, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And the Holy Spirit is the best answer to any prayer we could ever lay before God because it's his prompting of what to even pray for. He puts his burdens in our hearts so that we can bring them before the Father and the Father can answer them in his own perfect time and way. Also, you can pray that God would get the maximum glory out of your request, even if your request is imperfect. And so there are some great examples of this, but one of the best I've heard is from Otto Koning, who was a missionary in Indonesia, and he prayed and prayed and prayed for a specific native man who was very influential among the people. He was there as a missionary in a very dark and demonic culture, and he was really hoping that some of the native people would be converted to Christianity so they could start influencing their friends and neighbors and families to consider the message that Otto was bringing, the message of hope. And so he prayed very specifically for one tribal man that he felt would be a great asset to the gospel. And he had people all over the world praying for this man. Well, this man actually died before giving his life to Christ. He rejected God. And it felt like sort of uh, a disappointment, everything he prayed for. You know, he had a sight set on the salvation of this man. But he just said, okay, Lord, I it, was that a waste? Just, you know, should I keep praying along these lines? And it wasn't too much long after that 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 man's brother silently became a Christian. He was kind of a silent background character, and he gave his life to Christ in such a way right before he died that he told all of his family members and everyone who knew him, listen to what this missionary is telling you, it's the truth. And so his death actually had the same outcome that the missionary had prayed the first man would have. And so when you start to pray, Lord, I 
I have my sight set on this particular answer, but if you have an answer that will bring more glory to your name, I want you to do whatever in this situation will bring the most glory to you. And that's really a great way to be specific with our praying, but also keep a surrendered heart and allow God to work in whatever way he sees best. But meanwhile, we wrestle in prayer for the burdens we have the best that we know with as much as we can see. We wrote a book called Wrestling Prayer. So if you'd like to go deeper into that concept of wrestling and not just giving up after the first or second time that you pray, that would be a great book to read. Second principle of why we feel like God doesn't often answer our prayers or maybe heaven feels silent is maybe because we have breaches in our lives. We have habitual sin. We have a gap where the enemy can get through. And Corey Ten Boom talks about this concept of closing the circle. She talked about how her nephew, Peter, was praying very diligently for his friend. And his friend just continued to have the same problems over and over and over again. And even though the friend said he wanted to be set free and he was asking and crying out to God for an answer, it wasn't until they met with this young man and they asked him to confess any unconfessed sin or habitual sin in his life that she said the circle was closed and the enemy could no longer longer keep coming back in. And we need to have that concept of the closed circle around our lives as well. For God to really acknowledge and answer our praying, we can't be entrenched in willful, habitual sin. It says in Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. If we are harboring sin and cherishing sin and have our kind of secret vices that we're not willing to let go of and renounce, then there is that barrier between our prayers actually being answered. Answered. Amy Carmichael said once that even a small trifling sin, if we know it is there and we choose not to renounce it and we have no intention of getting it out of our life, is enough to render real prayer ineffective. And I've definitely seen that, that true in my own life. When God was really convicting Eric and I of wrestling in prayer and being specific with prayer for all these different areas that we felt defeated in, we had to let him really shine his searchlight in our soul and close up those gaps in our circle. So we begin to feel, just go before God and say, Lord, where do we need to be convicted of sin? Where do we need to make changes in our life? And God just gently revealed things. Okay, this is a an access point for the enemy. This is something that is not pleasing to me. And we begin to repent of those things, cleanse those things out of our lives. And one of the biggest areas for most of us that will put a huge barrier into our prayer life is unforgiveness. And unforgiveness is a sin because God commands us to forgive others as he forgives us. And so even and Eric and I, people we thought we had forgiven, but we we're still kind of holding on to that bitterness, went through that process of laying down that unforgiveness and freshly, by the grace of God, fully forgiving those people. And it made a huge difference in seeing answers to prayer in our life. It says in Matthew 6, 18, Jesus says, if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. So that's a very serious reason why sometimes our prayers don't seem to go any further than the ceiling. If you feel like that resonates with you, maybe take some time to just prayerfully let God have his way, shine his searchlight within your soul, gently bring to the surface things that might be standing in the way, whether it's bitterness, unforgiveness, or habitual sin in your life that you are not really letting go of. Let God walk you through that repentance process and know that once you have repented of that sin, it's it's no longer part of you. God cleanses it from you. It's as far away from you as the East is from the West. And you can then come to him with a pure heart, a clean conscience, and without that barrier in the way. The third principle is understanding the concept of what Eric calls the two-sided ticket. Now, he has a whole message on the two-sided ticket, which I think you can find at ellersley.com, but it's basically the principle that God often answers our prayers just not in the way we expected. And sometimes the, the, the side of the ticket we're seeing is not the side we wanted to see, but it's because he has a higher purpose. He has something even better that he's doing. It's not because he gave us a lesser version of our our, our hopes and dreams. It's because he has something even bigger that will bring even greater glory to his name. And so our job, when we get the ticket that says, okay, no, or wait, when we were expecting a yes, when we flip it over, if we could flip it over, we see, 
I am have doing something so much bigger than you can ever dream or imagine. Corey Ten Boom is a great example of this. She prayed and prayed and prayed that God would not send her to Germany and she would not be put into a, a concentration camp, especially a German concentration camp, because she was found out for harboring Jews during the Second World War in Holland. And they, of course, the way they punished people in that time, the, the Nazis were ruthless and they would put these people who were just trying to help the Jewish people into concentration camps, and they would be subject to torture and death. And she prayed, God, please deliver me from that. And God's answer was different than she had prayed for. He allowed her to be put into a German concentration camp, and he allowed even a lot of her family members to die. And her sister, who was her closest friend throughout that whole experience, died in the concentration camp. But God began to reveal to her as she was miraculously released, and God began to open an amazing ministry for her after the war, that she never would have had the ability to speak into the lives of hundreds of thousands of people the way that she did if she had not had that concentration camp experience. And she often would read the poem which is called the tapestry poem. And it's just very short, but it captures this principle. My life is but a weaving between my God and me. I cannot choose the colors he weaveth steadily. Oft times he weaveth sorrow, and I in foolish pride forget he sees the upper and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttle cease to fly will God unroll the canvas and reveal the reason why. The dark threads are as needful in the weaver's skillful hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. He knows, he loves, he cares. Nothing this truth can dim. He gives the very best to those who leave the choice to him. And that was the story of her life. She looked back and realized she was able to speak to prisoners. She was able to speak to people who had lost family members. She was able to speak to people going through horrific experiences because God allowed her to go to the concentration camp. He was giving her that two-sided ticket. You're asking for this, but I want to give you something even better. So keep that in mind if it feels like maybe you're getting a different answer than what you've been praying for. Number four, we need to learn how to separate the enemy's work from God's work in our life. And we've done episodes in the past on fortification, on resisting enemy attack. So I'm just going to touch on this really briefly. But it's really easy for us to confuse the enemy's attack with God just doing bad things to us or giving, you know, giving us things that bring us weak, make us weaker versus stronger. In reality, a lot of times that's the attack of the enemy, but the enemy wants us to blame those attacks on God and push God away as a result. But the Bible gives us a very clear directive when it comes to enemy attack, and that is to resist the enemy. We are to submit to God, as it says in James, but resist the devil. And a lot of times we don't resist the devil. We accept everything that is thrown at us as coming from God, when in reality, we need to define the difference. What is an attack of the enemy and what is being allowed in my life by God for a higher purpose, like Corey Ten Boom? She didn't look at the concentration camp as a work of the enemy, even though the enemy was very much a part of what happened in the concentration camp. God had a higher purpose and his grace was there. And through that experience, she gained greater spiritual strength. But there are other situations where the enemy is just hindering and thwarting, and that's something we need to resist. During Paul's ministry, the Apostle Paul, he talked about being hindered by Satan from a specific purpose that he was trying to accomplish. That's in 1 Thessalonians 2.18. And that word hindered means to to impede or detain or to cut into. So the enemy's goal is to put barriers in our way. If we're heading towards something that God has called us to, you know, put a lot of roadblocks in our way and cause us to get frustrated and want to give up. One of the areas that the enemy most hinders me in is discouragement. A lot of times, right when I'm stepping into some new form of ministry, I'll get hit with this huge amount of discouragement, and I'll have to stop and recognize this is an attack of the enemy. I resist it in the name of Jesus, in my position in Christ, and not accept it as just like, well, I guess God's just allowing me to wallow in discouragement right now. I see it as an attack of the enemy, and I resist in the power of Jesus' name. The enemy most often hinders us when we are stepping into ministry, taking steps of obedience in our life, cultivating a deeper relationship with Christ. That might mean prayer, Bible study, etc. And so we need to look at scripture and say, how do I know what to resist and what to submit to? Now, again, we've covered this in other episodes. So I'm just going to hit on it super briefly here. But God is a God of light. The enemy is darkness. God brings life. The enemy brings death. God is the father of lights. The enemy is the father of lies. God brings godly discipline. The enemy brings abuse. 
God is seen as a bridegroom, a loving bridegroom. The enemy is portrayed as a harsh, abusive husband, and God is portrayed as a shepherd, and the enemy is portrayed as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So keep in mind the difference between what might be coming from the enemy and what might be coming from God. And if you feel like you're under enemy attack, study what it means to resist and take your position in Christ. You can listen to previous episodes that we've done on resisting enemy attack. If you go to setapart.org, there are articles on that. And there are just a lot of great resources out there on awakening to the fact that we don't have to just take whatever the enemy throws at us. Now, keep in mind, God will allow us to go through challenges. When we resist the enemy, that does not mean we're just living on a you know, beautiful tropical island for the rest of our life and eating grapes. We will go through difficulty and suffering if we choose a set-apart life. But keep this in mind, just like physical training, if you are training for an athletic event, it's going to be hard. It brings pain, but it's a healthy, productive pain that leads to greater strength and purpose and hope. An attack of the enemy brings doubt, disillusionment, hopelessness, and defeat. The enemy's strategy often is to set off bombs in our life and then whisper, hey, can you believe that God did that to you when it was actually not God's doing at all? God gives us the tools to resist the enemy, not to just pray about negative things that happen in our lives, but when we know it's an enemy attack, to take authority over those attacks. And a great verse to start with is James 4, 7, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And that's a promise that we can stand on. The fifth principle of why it may seem that God is not answering our prayer is that sometimes the answer comes in God's time rather than our time. And prayer is never, ever a waste. God's word will never return void. And there are so many amazing stories that you can look at throughout history that demonstrate that prayer is never a waste. And I don't really have time to go into them in full detail here, but there are some different stories. I would encourage you to read the story of Svea Flood, that's an amazing story of she and her husband going to a remote tribe in Africa and being met with seeming failure. She died and most of the other missionaries died and the only person left was her husband. And he was so frustrated and bitter that it seemed like God had forsaken them that he walked away from his faith. And Savea Flood had had a little girl who ended up in the United States with another missionary family because the father didn't want anything to do with her. And she grew up and and found this amazing testimony. Her mother, Savea Flood, had witnessed to one little tribal African boy who used to clean his house. And it seemed like there was no fruit to their ministry. But years and years and years later, that little boy grew up and became a catalyst of revival to come to that whole area. And revival broke out, churches were formed, and she was able to see the fruit of her parents' ministry decades after they ever went there. And she was able to share that with her father, who had become bitter against God, and he gave his life back to Christ because he realized this wasn't a waste, this wasn't in vain. Now, not every waiting story that God takes it through is going to be that long or that dramatic, but even in the face of seeming defeat and seeming failure and God seeming to not even hear or answer, God is still at work behind the scenes, and sometimes things happen in His timing versus our timing. There's another great story about Robert Jaffrey, who was an amazing missionary who had been missionary to multiple different countries. And towards the end of his life, he had a real passion and burden to reach the unreached people in New Guinea. They had just discovered all of these tribes that had never been reached with the gospel. And he met with this missionary that I've quoted many times named Darlene Dibler. This was right as the, the war was breaking out before the Japanese took over their country that where they were missionaries. But he he showed her specifically on a map, these are the areas we're going to reach with the gospel of Christ. And we're this war will not hinder us. We are going to bring the gospel to these people. Well, then the Japanese took over and Darlene's husband was killed. She and her husband were the first ones to trek in there, but they couldn't continue their ministry. Her husband was killed in a concentration camp. All the missionaries that they had basically to reach those tribes, most of them died or were too ill to continue after the war, and Robert Jaffrey himself died. And so you would think, well, he had this whole vision. He showed her on the map. Was that Were all his prayers for those people a waste? Well, Darlene went back to the United States, married a man who had a passion to go there, went back to that very area, and she was a missionary with her second husband there for 40 years and saw amazing fruit for the gospel. And so it was in the very area that Robert Jaffrey had pointed at on a map. So just two little quick glimpses into missionary stories where you can just see so clearly that our prayers are never wasted, even though God's timing may be different than ours. 
A few last quotes that I want to give you about prayer just to encourage you. Prayer is never a waste. God does hear and answer prayer, and God asks us to pray with persistence, with that wrestling spirit, and not to give up. He delights in those who come to him as that Canaanite woman saying, Lord, please hear my prayer. Even if I take a crumb from that falls from the children's table, that will be enough to give me everything that I need. So here's what Amy Carmichael said. Prayer is the core of the day. Take prayer out and the day would collapse. And I found that to be true in my life. We need to make prayer not an afterthought, but the core of our day. We need to pray with our eyes on God, not on the difficulties that we're facing. Because when you go to God and all you can see are the the roadblocks, the mountains standing in your way, that's what we focus on. What we need to be focusing on is the strength and the power and the promises of God. Prayer does not fit us for the greater work, prayer is the greater work. Patience is more than endurance. A saint's life is in the hands of God like a bow and arrow in the hands of an archer. That was from Oswald Chambers, and I absolutely love that. So I hope this episode has given you at least a glimpse into that question, why hasn't God answered my prayer? Why does it seem like he hasn't answered my prayer? There are many more resources that you can check out at setapart.org. Definitely the book, Wrestling Prayer, any books by Ian Bounds. There's a lot of great resources out there. I want to cheer you on and challenge you to continue to bring your request before God in importunate praying, and you will see God work in your life. Hope you've enjoyed this week's episode. Check our resources out at setapart.org, and I pray you have a blessed and Christ-centered week.